Welcome, everybody. Uh, hope everybody's having the first good day here. I know uh, things are starting to ramp up and a lot going on out there in the exhibition hall. Um, but today we're going to start talking about how to become a professional, professional level strength coach. I think uh, over the last 10 years especially, it's really accelerated in what we expect at our level, even in the minor levels, minor league levels. Um, and then we'll kind of give an overview. But really, I've been in the profession for 20 years, and I'm going to say the most exciting time has probably been in the last seven to eight. So just kind of giving an overview of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about where we started um, uh, as strength coaches in professional baseball, kind of where we are now, uh, how the job market has evolved, um, how our professional duties have evolved, and, and how they continue to keep evolving on a yearly basis. Um, nutrition and supplemental factors, how to prepare yourself for the career, um, and what you can expect once you get in the, into this profession. And then once you, what do you expect, where do you look for it? Because I know a lot of people come to the NSCA or some other places you can look for some of these jobs. How far we've come. I mean, we're talking about parks that were considered now for maybe double A size parks. That's where professional baseball has started. And now they're holding 30, 35,000 on a, on a nightly basis. Where we started. First MLB strength coach started in the late uh, 70s. Um, it was more of calisthenics is what they would call it. Um, and then it slowly evolved. The first uh, PBS CCS meetings were held in the mid-1900s, uh, or 1990s. And then uh, it really started to evolve when the PBS CCS meetings were held actually at the winter meetings uh, where MLB holds it and we kind of started off and kicked it off the weekend before. That was in 2005 in Dallas. So as slowly as it evolved over the 90s and 80s and 90s, it really started to pick up in the 2000s. When you start comparing a lot of the things, I was going to go back 20 years, but about 2005, we started getting some data, and it was very spaced out, and there wasn't a whole lot to pull from to find out, you know, where strength coaches were coming from. Ryan Stoneberg from the Royals did a, an amazing job over the years trying to pull all this information in, in and put it in one place so we can kind of get an idea of where everybody was at as organizations, all 30 organizations throughout. So when I look back, I couldn't get everything I wanted, and since really... Over the last 10 years, it's been exciting. I kind of just blocked that 10 years in and just did a comparison of then to this past year. So in 2010, all of the minor league organizations, 94% of the teams or organizations had primary strength conditioning coaches per team in their minor league system. Only 32% of those were full-time. And out of those 32%, 70% received an additional housing. So figure if you go to a minor league affiliate, that's not where you live, and your salary is, say, 25000 at the time, you still have to pay rent somewhere if you're not in that 70% of housing. So a lot of it was a lot of struggling, trying to sleep on couches, find roommates, stuff like that to get it going. You move forward to 2019, 99% of uh, all organizations have strength coaches, which is a 5% increase. 86% are now full-time, which is huge. Um, and 90% of them are receiving full-time salaries. So they're actually being lumped in as a coaching staff and being uh, put in that type of salary system where there is a living allowance, there is meal money that is coaching meal money, and the salaries have increased greatly. Um, if you start looking at comparisons of MLB averages as far as salary, then you can start looking at the growth in really the last 10 years also. You look at... In 2010, the MLB strength coach average was 81,000. Okay, so, okay, salary. 2019, the average is 121. That's that's a 48 percent growth in a very short amount of time. And you're still only talking about 30 jobs in the world. You're talking about 30 major league teams. So that's a huge, huge increase. If you're talking about minor league coordinator averages, 50. Uh, uh, 50,728, now 68, 753, also still increasing, 32% increase rate, um, but still growing. 
you're talking about when I took my coordinator role in 2005, my first salary was 37 grand. And that was to oversee all of the organization with zero full-time staff. So that's a huge, huge difference in, in where we've come from. And then the minor league average for strength coaches in 2010, there was not enough information to get full-time status or to get a full-time salary base. So we had no idea where that number would come from. Now, within the numbers of what we have, that average salary is 47,000. So if you're starting at a short season gig for your first year, 47K, that's not too bad coming out of college. So where, once again, where we've come from, where we're going, and not only that, where we continue to go is a huge difference and a huge increase over the short amount of time when we consider this profession in this sport. A lot of things are also, like I said, in the last eight years are growing and, and creating jobs and it's, it's going pretty fast and more and more things are happening. Uh, MLB teams are now carrying two strength coaches. For very traditionally, it was one strength coach on your team. And I'm going to say over the last probably four years, you started seeing more and more teams add that assistant and then add that assistant to travel. Because a lot of times those assistants wouldn't even travel with the major league team. When the tr major league team went on the road, they would just stay back, work with rehab, or go see minor league affiliates or do whatever. It wasn't until recently that they really started traveling with two. So this is, a, for, for us, the Reds, this, is, this will be our second year that we're actually traveling with two. So we're one of those teams that are creating more positions and evolving them. Uh, rehab coordinators, obviously that's such a big money maker out in the industry with PTs and everything. A lot of um, organizations are bringing it in-house. Well, when you bring PTs and ATCs in-house, the progression is to strength conditioning before we go on the field. So now we're actually getting rehab coordinators in those spots and that way that whole transitional rehab process that you would normally see in a PT clinic now actually occurs in-house. So there are those job opportunities there. Latin American coordinators, Dominican Republic, every organization has a Dominican Academy, usually one to two teams down there or one and a half teams. So you're talking about anywhere from one to three strength coaches, depending on the organization, that's going to be the Dominican Academy. You are still a part of that Academy is still a part of your organization, still a part of your development, and still a part of things that you want to progress from a 16 and a half year old Dominican kid to once they get to the state. So you want them to have a good understanding. You have to have a coordinator for that. You have to have them, somebody coming from the states that's based working with the minor leagues, going down and making sure those academies are doing what that progressive needs to be. And so Latin American coordinators, they've been around a little longer, but they're becoming more and more proactive in Latin America. And then along with the career paths, contracts, benefits, competitive pay, all things that really didn't exist until maybe the last 10 years except for major league strength coaches and minor league coordinators. Other than that, if you're a minor league strength coach at an affiliate or an assistant coordinator or something like that, there wasn't a whole lot of competition, there wasn't a whole lot to draw. Now those things are becoming more and more important to organizations and you're starting to see more and more good candidates which increase uh, a good career market and then competitive pay. Where we are now, MLB in their last CBA, their collective bargaining agreement, mandates that all levels of uh, your minor league affiliates require a CSCS. So if you're going to be a strength coach in professional baseball from the top all the way down, you have to have a minimum of CSES. There really is no more internships. That's how we kind of all broke in. The guys that have been around a long time. They were, even though we had CSES, they were still consider, considered internships. It really doesn't exist anymore. Every now and then there, there will be an internship at a lower level, but it won't be, won't be what it was and what it is now. At the major league level, uh, the CBA mandates that um, the major league and major league strength coach, assistant major league strength coach, your minor league uh, strength conditioning coordinators, your triple A and double A uh, strength coaches are all RSCC. The reason for that is you want somebody that's going to have two years, minimum two years of professional experience in, in the profession. And since we have 40 man guys in the minor leagues at our triple A and double A affiliates, we do want those RSCC certified guys at those levels. So we do have some sort of a professional experience level that we expect from our coaches to be working with those guys. So once they do get to the major league level, whether they're 
um, in AA or AAA that we all have the same experience and capacity to coach the way we want them to be coached at the time. Also, back in the day when I started, Donovan started, you know, guys like Zach started, that, that didn't exist. You could, you could work a year in A-ball and then be in AAA and then be a minor league coordinator in two, three years. Now, even with the CBA mandates and not having the RSCC, that doesn't even exist. The other things that are really coming up, sports science positions. If you notice more and more technologies, wearables, a lot of things are coming out where it's, it's a lot as a strength coach. And as a strength coach that's been in the profession for 20 years, a lot of this stuff is what we used to call the eye test. Now there's a numerical value to it, which is an amazing tool to have. However, there's so much coming out at such a rapid pace. What works and what doesn't? You have 250 athletes in one spot, which is spring training for a month. That's where you're going to kind of play with your toys and figure out what you're going to do. Then you're going to take some of those tools and you're going to utilize them with your affiliates. And within that, what are you going to utilize? Who's your point person on that? Because we have 15 on our staff. We're going to have different guys playing with it with their different age groups from 17, 18, 24, 30, 32. Where does it work? Where does it doesn't? And how valid and relevant is it to, to what we're trying to do? Is it going to help with programming? Is it not? So that, those positions are becoming more and more. Also with K-Vests and other things, platforms, uh, aggregate pa platforms, Catapult, Kinduck, those things, it's all, it's, it's a lot. So you do have to have a point person. Facility improvements. When we started, uh, or when I started in the game, uh, Sarasota, Florida, our minor league um, spring training, our spring training complex, I think our weight room for the major league side and minor league side was about 550 feet, square feet. It's a big room. If you don't, it's, it's, it's not a big room. It's not. Currently, right now, uh, we are in Goodyear, Arizona, and our weight room is 3,500 square feet. For 250 athletes, it's still not a big room. When we moved from Sarasota to Goodyear, we're like, this is going to be a big room. We're going to have plenty of room. We don't have plenty of room. We have very little room. And if you look at a lot of organizations, they're already redoing 10-year-old sites. So Cleveland Indians, last year, they opened up in Goodyear in 08, 09. They already redid their whole complex, tripled their weight room size, I believe. I believe you guys are doing something. We're looking at something in the next two years. Dominican programs are doing it. Domin our Dom Dominican Academy, their weight room was a little over 400 square feet. Now I think we got right around 2,000, 2,200 square feet. I mean, it's incredible what these facilities are growing into. And the reason is because, as we've all known for a long time, we're going to see every athlete every day. We're going to need our space. And as we talk about the biomechanics and the kinematics and all the kinesiology and everything about what we do, now you're starting to see some skilled coaches come in and go, well, we need, we need you to to help with this movement pattern. We need a corrective, we need this. Great, I need space. So now we're starting to broaden our, and expand our space to also involve some sports science stuff so we can have a little bit more biomechanical analysis and put a numerical value on things, which requires more space. So as we grow, things are gonna happen. And it's exciting, and it's an exciting time because it's happening pretty quick nowadays. And then talk about, um, Nutritional guidelines, that's an ongoing process. Uh, regulating supplementation, ongoing process. And then programming and really how that's changed over the last 15, 20 years. The sports science side, I think, is probably going to be the most progressive over the last five years. I think after baseball analytics kind of started taking off, then they started venturing into new areas and they started realizing that the sports science it's pretty important when it comes to injury prevention or return to play protocols. And a lot of things started coming into play when it started talking about a monetary value. Money gets played, now we gotta talk about what we're gonna do. So a lot of this is pushing about how do we, how do we decrease risk of injury, how do we decrease injuries, and then if there is an injury that occurs, how fast can we get them back in a safe and efficient manner? All of that comes back to the sports science. How do we put a number on it? How do we put progressions on it? Once again, the old school strength coach, eye test, progressions, start where you can start. Hopefully you have a baseline from testing. 
and work your way up, get into your 60s, 65, 70s, hopefully 80 to 85% of max volume workload before we start sending them out and doing ballistic movements. It's kind of a no-brainer. However, in this world of numbers, you're going to need a number. So the sports science realm, as you can see, there's a lot out there nowadays, is going to be huge in our profession. And honestly, when I'm looking for a candidate, and I know a lot of organizations, if you don't have that background of force plates or gym wear or something like that, you're kind of behind because that's, that's the forefront of how we're going to train, whether it's max velocity training or if it's just going to be biomechanical analysis, really. And then the use of data aggregation um, platforms and to help not only that, but now we're talking about real time. So in a collegiate setting, you're talking about all of your athletes being in one spot. When you get into the baseball realm, you're talking about eight teams throughout your organization. So when a player moves from Dayton, Ohio to Daytona, Florida, or Daytona, Florida to Chattanooga, Tennessee, or Chattanooga to Tennessee to Louisville, Kentucky, where does that information get transferred? Well, back in the day, we put in Excel spreadsheet, and when that guy got transferred up, it was sent. Now we've got these platforms where they do their workouts, they do everything else, everything is on an aggregate platform, and everybody has real time. So when that guy moves, that guy shows up in your clubhouse, boom, we have everything he has. That's kind of the technology that we needed a long time ago. However, it's now, and we're using it. So if you're a strength coach coming in, it's kind of important to at least have an idea of how it works because you're going to be immediately immersed in how are you going to use it, do you know how to use it, and if you don't know how to use it, how quickly can you learn? Because it's going to be in your lap immediately. You're going to have 30 days in spring training. Then you're going to have your own team, and you're going to, know, you're going to need to know how to use it. Along with sports science is facilities. We talked about facilities. So top left, that was, that was literally walking from the major league um, clubhouse out through the double doors to the batting cages. And that was about the amount of wall space I had from the door to door in Sarasota, Florida. And then it just went about, I don't know, 20 feet back, 25 feet back at best. That was my weight room for spring training. Now the bottom left, that's our Goodyear, Arizona, and that's just one wall. So that's the 3,500 square feet that we have. So that's just, that's just one side. So just seeing kind of a comparison of from 2000, we moved out of Sarasota in 2009, so that was 10 years ago compared to that now. That's not that long ago, really. And we're still looking to expand already because we're running out of space. Dominican Academy up top, um, that, was, that was half of the weight room. That's a, half, that's a half picture of a half of the weight room. And then the bottom one is, is now a picture from our roll top door looking into two thirds of it. Once again, a lot of things are happening, and a lot of good things are happening, but it's progressive, and it's continuing to progress because the more athletes we sign, the more they realize the importance of what we do, the more the rehab and the sports science come into it, the more room we need. We're, we're going to keep, keep asking, or it's going to keep happening because more and more, also, no more and more skill coaches are realizing the benefit of what we can help them do to be successful in what they do and then that kicks them to come back in and, and talk to us about body positioning, whatever that is. And then we have the facility and the, and the openness to teach. That's where we excel. Along with this, we move on to nutrition because now we're talking about supplementation bars, we're talking about smoothie bars, we're talking about having categories that we have to cover that we have to cover for our 40-man guys. So when I started, we were the front person on the supplement front. So, you know, guys would come in and at the time we had, let's see, I'm not going to date myself too much, but in 1999 with an internship with the Oakland A's and then 2001 when I had my own team, we had Champion Nutrition. And I don't know if anybody remembers Champion Nutrition, but that was, yeah, I know you do, but that was really it. And it was used by colleges and it was you know, it was a good product, and that's all we really had available. Unfortunately, our budget was about $100 a month, so there wasn't a whole lot we could buy. But we knew it was kind of coming. We all had an idea, so 
We were, we were preparing for it, but when it came to eating and eating on the road, players would come to us. So we had to do the best we can and go do our homework and figure out what the best, and, and granted, we had some background in our, in our education of, of nutrition and what we do, but as this keeps evolving as far as the science of nutrition and nutrition for rehab and nutrition for age and nutrition for, you know, deficits for people with allergies and sensitivities and, and all these things, you're going to need some, a clinician type person, which is where the registered dietitians come in. And really, I would say over the last five years, they've kind of hit the, you know, kind of hit the scene and, and came in in a big way. Um, in the last two years, we've hired a full-time registered dietitian and certified sports dietitian at the major and minor league levels. Um, I know a lot of organizations have them, and they are the ones that set up the menus. They're the ones that talk to players about um, weight gain, weight loss, anything that they have. And then, um, really, they're kind of still the, the – they're, now, granted, they don't – well, I don't know. Do you guys travel with one? You do. We haven't got there yet. So we don't travel with ours. Uh, Toronto does. Um, so still on the road, we're still, you know, we're still the forefront for certain things like that. But obviously when we get back home, we're going immediately to our dietitian. We're talking to um, the player and make sure that they get together on their plan moving forward on what, whatever their dietary needs are, whether it's on the road or at home, and making sure they have them. And um, I don't know the numerical value because there wasn't really any that I've seen uh, yet. But I know that there's probably... I'm going to say a third, somewhere between a third and a half of the 30 teams that will have full-time RDs, maybe more now. Um, but I know in the last three years, it's really taken off. So I think that's the biggest thing is that this is another area that within our profession, we need to understand that, yes, we do have RDs. Yes, they are going to be very helpful, but you're still going to be on the forefront of your athletes asking, is this going to be good? Is this going to be well? But they are a great resource for us that if we need to ask something, we can. And the reason for that is, is the supplementation part. And the supplementation part has become quite a big deal to players. And they've also put this in a CBA um, that we have to have 10 categories that we have to define for our 40-man guys. That we have to provide 10 categories of supplements on or in season and off season and during spring training. So within that. We also have to have a good education and understanding of what we can do, what we need, and what categories we need to fill. So that is still in our that's still on our plate, and that still is our um, our responsibility to do. So as we go to all of these um, exhibitions and we talk, we have to we have to fill a list, and per MLB, that list has to be an NSF certified for sport list. So everything that we're going to do is going to be NSF certified for sport. There is no gray area in that. It is NSF certified for sport, and that's it. And the players will continue to bring something. Well, I found this. I got, is it NSF certified for sport? No. Then it's a no. Yeah, but I got this. Is it, is it NSF certified? Then, then it's a no. But that list is constantly evolving. You will constantly have companies that add or drop out of that program so you really have to stay up on that list because at one point when it started, it was four to five pages of supplements. That's bars, vitamins, omegas, um, protein powders, RTD shakes, I mean all of it. There is now 36 pages of supplements. And that changes daily. It go to 35, then it'll go to 37. Then it'll go, it, it changes. So we have to stay up on that. We have to make sure that we're aware of what's going on, what's still certified, what's not, and then put a plan together for that next year because there's something that might be in your supplement drawer uh, one year that they've dropped, and now the next year you're like, oh, we're going to... No, we're not. you got to stay up on your stuff. So that still falls in line of what we do. And then moving to the last, the programming. I think one of the coolest things is... is now we've moved past, the, and I love the saying is, the most dangerous phase in the language is we've always done it that way. And I'm going to tell you what, baseball was great at that. 
when I came in, why do we do this? Well, we've always done it that way. Okay, well, what if we do it this way? No, that's not the way we did it. But can we do that? No, we can't. Oh, okay. All right, great. That's changed. It truly has changed. And the guys that have been around, we banged our head on a lot of walls because we knew it was the right way, but it wasn't the old school way. And that old school way is changing, and that's incredible to see over the last 20 years. But the biggest thing is the sports science education and being able to talk to your position coaches and give them an answer that they understand and have the education and the understanding to let them know that what we're doing and why we're doing it is for the benefit of the player and to make their job easier to help them create a better, a more mobile, a more utilizable athlete for them to do what they need to do on the field. So the biggest thing that you want to do is to make sure that you have a good relationship with your, with your skilled coaches because essentially they're going to either have your back or they're not. And your players are going to work with both of you in separate venues. So if you all are talking the same language, it makes it a very cohesive and a very good working relationship. You also have your better technologies that can help you explain it. A lot of these guys are like, I don't get it. What's the number? Well, there is no number. Then how can you explain it? So now if you have a number and numerical value, that's going to help. And the technologies are allowing us to do that now. Yes, we had sets and reps. Yes, we can explain percentages and, and progressions and stuff like that. And they went, yeah, great, I don't care. They want to know percentage. They want to know exit velocities. They want to know certain things. And what are you doing to help them get better? And what's that number that's going to correlate to that other number? With those technologies, we're allowed to do that. And how you do that is having more experienced strength coaches and having the coaches that better understand the sports-specific programming and both in and off-season because your off-season is going to affect your in-season. Your in-season is going to be tough enough as it is. So if you have a poor off-season or a successful off-season, that's going to really show in your your in-season programming and your in-season success. So you want to make sure that all of these kind of fall in line that, yes, we've got away from that old school mentality. Yes, we've got sports science on our side. Yes, we've got better technologies. But do you have the strength coach that's going to have that ability to speak to those coaches and understand what they're trying to say and speak the same language as that skill coach? Because if not, you're going to miss on that mark too. So you do have to have the experienced strength coach to be able to go to that skill coach and go, this is what we have. This is how it's going to help. And speak it in the language that they're going to understand and go, Thank you, I get that. And that comes with experience because I'm going to tell you what, we all got thrown in the fire and there was, there, was, there was a lot of misunderstandings along the way. But as all of it evolved, it got better and better and better. And now we're in a really good spot as strength conditioning is in professional baseball. So moving on, when you talk about some of the steps in how to become a professional strength coach. Now we kind of got the history, how it evolved, kind of where it's at. And I don't want to date us either. About nine years ago, Matt Krause and I uh, worked on a, a PowerPoint and uh, came up with the five essential steps of becoming a professional strength conditioning coach. And then as those were defined, put this PowerPoint together, and then I went and presented at the national conference Um, for the NSCA, and I keep going back to this because all of these things still matter today. When I look at a candidate or I look at something, I go, all of these things, better they better check all these boxes because if not, they're probably going to fail in this profession because it just doesn't exist. And, And you get exposed right away. With all the internet and everything out there, your players are doing research, they're looking at stuff, and they're coming in and they're going, hey, I just read this, what do you think? We're going to tell them. Do you know the answer? Do you not know the answer? Because it's every day. It's coming every day. So we're going to talk about the first thing, education. Obviously, our basis of everything we do starts with our education. You want to choose a college program or a university program that offers an exercise science tract. I know that in the past that you could get away with a, um, a BA or you know, some, you know, some track that isn't sports, uh, science-based, but honestly, now with the exercise physiology and the kinesiology and all of the sports medicine and all of the technology, 
you really, you really have to have that sports science base. Um, I think a lot of guys that when you see that they didn't have that sports science base, you can see them missing on a lot of levels of when they start talking about certain things and they got to catch up. The nice thing is with the CSCS, you do have to kind of get in your exercise phys and get in your biochemistries and stuff like that to get, take the test and have some understanding. However, when the questions get tougher and tougher, at least have an understanding of where to look for the answer. Because a lot of times it's like, oh, I don't know the answer. I'll, but I'll find out for you. I'll know tomorrow. And you'll have to go look it up. And at least having the education and the understanding of where to go look is really important because you're going to have to find that answer out pretty quick. And then for me, I became a member of the NSCA as a student. And this helped me in the, being able to access um, development, center, development centers, um, at the time, I didn't need a grant or a scholarship, but it showed a lot of things of interest that I could have taken. Um, educational content, I think, was probably the biggest thing for me, and the access to the library, because I think the biggest thing is, is that when you start going down the path of strength conditioning, you start working with athletes, these questions come up, you start asking questions yourself. As a practitioner, as a coach, and you start looking at things that, what am I looking for, what did I miss? lead me down a path to what's better. Maybe there's a better way to do it. Maybe my way is not the best way. Maybe it is. Prove me wrong. Scientifically prove my, wrong, my way is not the best way. And if you can, great. I, I love the conversation. But if not, I have my science to prove me right. So I love that conversation. I love it with my coaches. I love it with my colleagues in baseball. And I love it with my athletes. Because that means they're listening. And that means they want the education. They want the conversation. And it sparks a lot of good conversations that take you down paths that you probably didn't realize you would be thinking or taking in the first place. So a lot of those access and libraries and publications bring up great conversations with all of your staff and athletes, which I find very, very valuable. Certifications, obviously for, for having um, credentials and everything like that, it's, you're going to need your certifications. Your essentials text online, um, we have to have it for MLB. Uh, registered strength conditioning coach, and then RSCC after a couple years. Um, this shows a level, uh, level of education, knowledge, and professionalism. I think that's the biggest thing, is that as you look at these, as you look at these tiers of certification, CSCS, we know what you took. We know what education you went through. We knew what test you went through. RSCC, we know you have to have two years of professional experience. We know you had to be on the floor. We know you're a practicing strength coach. That does make a difference when we're looking for candidates of where we're hiring. Because a lot of times as, a, as an organization, our AAA guy might get hired by somebody else and move on to a minor league coordinator position or something else. And then you've got to find a AAA guy. Maybe you don't have somebody in your lower levels that are certified yet RSCC. So you need to look for an RSCC. So it shows that le level of professionalism and experience. And then... Liability insurance. This is, I mean, it's been offered since I've started, and I still am amazed how many guys don't come in with their liability insurance. If you're working in the private sector and you're working in different venues, regardless if it's a professional team or not, you need to protect yourself. Not only your athlete or your client, you need to protect yourself. And the only way to do that, and the, really it's not that expensive, is the liability insurance. We all carry it. Not only do we have to carry it, I would carry it anyway. I've always carried it. And the reason for it is, is because when I go work with athletes, not only in season, in the off season when I go off site and I go work with athletes wherever they're at, I go to Miami, I go to Texas, I go to Arizona, I go all these places, I'm not always working at a Reds facility. I'm working at a PT clinic. I'm working at somewhere else. I want to be covered. And I want to know that I'm okay. And I want to know my athlete's okay. So the only way to do that, have your insurance. Once again, I'm dating myself, but back in the day, internships and graduate assistantships were the way to go. Um, I got a GA at University of Tennessee when I was doing my master's, so you know I was a graduate assistant with football and baseball, um, and then we worked with track and field, swimming, soccer, tennis, golf. I mean, we had them all, but my, my priority was baseball, and then I assisted with football, and then anybody else that wandered in, great. Um, and <clears throat> when I first got hired, there were internships. They were non-paid. My first internship was with the Oakland A's in 1999. I lived 
three and a half, four hours away, and I would drive there for the home series. I would sleep on the trainer's table. I did not get paid. I did not work with a single athlete. I wrote a book of notes. I used a ton of Clorox wipes or spray, and I stocked shelves with Champion Nutrition products. That's what I did as an intern. And I, as soon as they left town, I drove back up and worked my other job. And then when they came back into town, I drove back down and I did it again for the six days, eight days, whatever that was. And that was my opportunity. And I took it. And I had no question that I was, it didn't matter. No, it was not paid. Yes, it was all on my dime. Okay, great. I was okay with that. But that gave me my opportunity. So those things, you can find them sometimes, but for the most part, the internships and the grad assistantships, I thought were the most valuable thing. And if you can find them still, I still think they're important. Because I still think it gives you a very good knowledge of what's happening and sit back and look at the whole picture of the floor being worked or a strength coach working with an athlete or multiple athletes and just taking notes and having an understanding of relationships personalities, importance of talking, importance of explanation, and having an understanding of when is it a good time to work and when is it a good time to not work. And you don't know that unless you just watch. I still watch my coaches. I still, I, I watch young coaches come up and I'm, it's pretty impressive the level of, of education, level, level of excitement and the stuff that they bring to the floor and just kind of watch. And you have 70, 60, 70 athletes on the floor and you have nine, 10 coaches of your own and you're watching and you watch everything work really well and you're like, this is, this is some pretty cool stuff. And, and you watch your athletes buy in and it's, it's fun to watch. But to have all that, you have to have the experience. And without the experience and knowing what to target as your specific experience, you really don't know. If you don't go work football, how do you know you don't like football? Or you do. Or baseball. Everybody loves baseball. Go work a baseball season. You're going to find out if you love baseball really quick. Real, really, really quick. I love baseball. Nope. Don't like baseball anymore. I've done it for 20 years, so I love baseball. I know what's coming. I love it. So, but it does take a certain person. I'm not going to say what kind of person, but a certain person that has to buy in and do this. And the guys that do, they get it. And the guys that don't, they last six months. And that's okay. It's also great to know and go in and know that you do this, it's a great experience, that ain't for me. Okay, that's all right too. I know there'll be sports that if I did that, I'd be like, wow, that was great. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Yeah, that, that's terrible. And then don't forget that any experience is a good experience, whether it's high school, collegiate, or professional. I've done all three. I've done private, I've worked with high schools, I've obviously been in college in the professional setting, and every one of them I took something from, some more than others. There's a lot of times that I took things that I was like, oh, I'm never doing that again. That was not the right thing to do. That was a great thing, I need to do that again. There's certain things that I wanna make sure that I do over. I wanna refine this, I wanna do this. And that's where the experience comes in within those internships and grad assistantships that make you very valuable to be hired. I think that's another big thing to understand is that all these experiences and everything that we've talked about up to this point defines you as a coach and makes you marketable. So you need to make sure that whatever you're doing and you're doing well, market that. It's important. You've got all the education, you've got your experiences, you've got everything going on. Now go find a job. If you look back or you think back to some of the few slides earlier, you look back and how, how, much we, how much our percentages have increased over the years. Back in the day, when you came to a conference, I came looking for a job. I came with 20 resumes, I came in a suit, and I came ready to be prepared to be interviewed. That's not really how it works anymore. Nowadays, we'll post, we'll post on the NSCA. The other one we'll post is on the PBS CCS website, and I'll put that up later too. But those are really where these jobs are. And back in the day, the NSCA was the conference for, for baseball strength coaches. 
That's where I got my first job. Now, since we moved on in 2005 to the MLB winter meetings, there are still a bunch of us that still come to the NSCA. There's still a bunch that do come and uh, come to interview or meet candidates or whatever. But that's not where all the jobs are. So you've got to be aware that this is, this is a small group of us that come that we want to make sure that, yeah, that's great, because I'm also networking. I, I'm always networking. I love to meet new people. I love to see what's going on outside. And believe it or not, a lot of those reps out there, they've got the insight on what's open and what's not. You talk to the, you talk to the, the Tom Profits of the world. You talk uh, hammer strength, power systems, you, or perform better. You talk to power lift. You talk, I'm going to tell you what, those guys know more about what's happening in the professions. You'd be like, wait a minute, what? What job's open? You're like, oh, yeah, that, that was like two weeks ago. Like, Come on. That, that ain't even hit the paper yet. Oh, yeah, that's open. Oh, it's already been filled, too, by the way. I mean, they're, they're, they have a great source of networking themselves that are very valuable. Introduce yourself. Be prepared to always be interviewed at any time. I always felt that if I walked through and I bumped into somebody, it was a potential interview. I'm not sure who it was. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was a guy with the same amount of experience as I did. I don't know. And since I didn't know, I was always prepared to be on point. So the biggest thing is, is even though it's a conversation, maybe it's a very important conversation. And maybe it's in passing. Maybe it's not. But if you always leave an impression, and then you come up and you're like, hey, I left you my resume. Now, granted, once again, dating myself, resumes were on paper back in the day. And you would hand them out. And people would actually read them before they threw them away. Now, I don't know if I've seen a paper resume unless I've printed it out myself in the last 10 years. However, if somebody came up and gave me a resume and paper, I would remember that person. Mainly because I never see it anymore, and that would probably be more of a shock factor than anything. But that's sometimes what it takes. Have an idea of what you want to go look at what your resume is and what you're applying for. Because when you start networking to find a job, people are going to want to know why. Why do you want to be in football? Why do you want to be in baseball? Why do you want to be a high school strength coach, collegiate strength coach, whatever that is? So be prepared. And then when you see those job listings, be ready. Because a lot of times they're, they're up and they're gone. I know as a, as a coordinator, Zach, when he was coordinator at Donovan, um, Morgan Gregory, who's my coordinator, I know that we will get 100 resumes before we ever apply for or ever um, post a job. We'll get 100 resumes and we don't even have an opening. And most of those resumes are not experienced. A lot of them don't have CSCS. They're just searching. So when you send something or you see a job listing and they ask for certain things, Send the things they ask for. I know that sounds funny, but when I ask for a resume, a cover letter, a resume, and references, don't put references available upon request on your resume. I've already requested them. I don't want to request them again. I'm not going to request them again. That resume has now found the round file cabinet on the floor. Because I printed it out still, because I still like to read it on paper. So know that when the postings come up, send what they ask. And I'm going to say, I'll probably save this, I mean, not save this, but commitment. You've gone through school, whether it's for, you went and got your master's, whatever it was. You have your experience, you have your certifications. You know what long hours are. We've all been on the floor. They're 14 hour days, they're 12 hour days, they're 16 hour days. They are what they are, there's no days off. Depending on your season, there's not a day off. And if there is a day off, you're in the office and you're doing just administrative duties trying to catch up. There is, or you're programming, or you're getting ready for the next day because your next team's coming in, or your next group, or your next whatever, where you've got seven groups the next day and you're, you're setting their progressions that day. There's no day off. Maybe you're working at home, but that's not a day off. 
I've seen what people do on their days off that are friends of mine that have weekends off. It's amazing. Like, they go to the lake. Like, they, they, they go do stuff. Like, it's, it's impressive. Like, oh, yeah, we're going to the cabin. Cabin for a weekend? Yeah, it's the weekend. It's off days. There's no off days. And now with the technology of phones, you're always accessible. Emails, texts, phone, Instagram, Twitter. I don't even know what else because I'm, I'm still not savvy in all of it. I mean, you're always accessible. And they expect you to be accessible. Your athletes expect you to be accessible. accessible. Your coaching staff, your front office, you're always accessible. Modest salaries, I mean, they're okay. They are improving. They're getting way better, and they're getting better quick. So, honestly, my first, my first, um, my first gig with the Milwaukee Brewers, my pay was eight hundred a month, no room and board, no living allowance, no meal money. Ah, I got twenty dollars a day meal money on the road, um, and I had to pay my own taxes. That was in 2001. I don't want to say that wasn't that long ago, but in the, in the grand scheme, that's not that long ago. And there was a lot of guys that did that to set this platform for these $47,000 salaries for guys coming out of college. And I love the fact that we're there. I do love the fact that we're there. But there are guys that were grinders for 20 years, 15 years before me, the Montezes, the Babalejos, Matt Krause, all these guys that were grinders, Donovan along with me, I mean, we're, we've, we've stuck it out for a long time. And we've put up a lot of poor salary numbers and watched them increase as we, as we got better, hired better coaches, got better facilities. It's worked. So they are getting better. Know that you're going to have limited time during, with your family during the season. Whether you're married, you're not, you, you're, you live close to your mom and dad. Now, if you're going to get into an affiliate, you're going to be in spring training for 30 days. Probably, you probably don't live in Arizona or Florida. And then that affiliate, you probably don't live in Pulaski, Tennessee. Or Billings, Montana. Or Dayton, Ohio. You don't. You just don't. And you're going to move. And as you progress in your career and you, you bump up, your affiliates are going to change with you. So for us, it goes from Greenville, Tennessee, to Billings, Montana, to Dayton, Ohio, to Daytona, Florida, to Chattanooga, Tennessee, to Louisville, Kentucky, to Cincinnati. And there's more teams. I think we're, we have a pretty good location as far as affiliates and, and other than Billings that's out there in Arizona. But there's some that are California to Massachusetts to Texas League. To, I mean, you're, they're all over the place. So... You're going to move, or you're just not going to be in baseball. That's just how it is. And if you think that you're going to be like, oh, no, I live in Dayton. I'll just be the strength coach there. No, you won't. You'll be there for a year or two, and then if you don't want to move, you'll move on somewhere else because the progression is just that. There isn't going to be, oh, I'm going to stay in Dayton, and then I'm going to jump to Cincinnati once that position. No, no, you're not. It's not how that works. Some people think that's how it works. That's not how that works. So know that you're going to have limited time, and mainly it's because you're going to be gone. And there's no days off. So put the two and two together, it's really poor family time during the year. Um, and then when you do have time off, back to the administrative duties, because there's biweekly reports, monthly reports, 40-man reports, player reports. All that stuff has to come up because, you know what, the front office wants to know. So in your spare time on the bus to the next city or on the plane or wherever you're at, you're on a computer and you're doing that. So it is a commitment. Know the commitment. Know what you're getting into. If you think it's baseball, oh, we get there at 7 o'clock, play a game. Throw a little weight around. What does that take, like a half hour? Huh. Love that schedule. We're there at noon and I get home at 1.30 in the morning and that's with an average three-hour game. As a minor league coordinator, we got there at 5 in the morning. I got home about 6 at night. That's still, the, still right in the wheelhouse. Depending on the day, it's pretty close. And it's baseball every day. If you notice, 
Baseball doesn't have weekends off. That's usually when the gates are open. Friday nights, no, those, no, those, th there's baseball on those nights. Yeah. Holiday, 4th of July, no, big baseball day. Big baseball day. You'll be working. So know that all of this is a commitment. Know what's going to happen. Maybe one of the biggest things and one of the biggest killers of strength coaches in this profession is the professional working relationship. One of the biggest things that I try to tell people and the coaches that I've worked with have tried to tell people is that once you get to the professional level, they're getting paid too. They're no longer collegiate athletes. They're professional athletes getting paid and they're trying to make it themselves. It's no longer a teacher-student relationship. It's not like college. It's not even close. Even at the lower levels, it's not close. So if you go to a collegiate level, I remember leaving Tennessee where I had 21, 22-year-olds going to Ogden, Utah, and having kids still drafted right out of high school that just signed for millions of dollars, by the way. They're paid athletes. They're professionals. So that working relationship does matter. And realize, they're professionals just like you. They have salaries just like you. They're fighting for a job a lot of times just like you. You're, you're trying to fight for the next level. If your style of coaching is expecting your athletes to follow you and barking orders and yelling and being, that's great. It ain't baseball. Stay in college. That, dude, that, that lives there. I loved it when I did it there. I had a great time there. That doesn't live in baseball. Just doesn't happen. And not only that, you really can't do that because most of the time you're lifting on the road in a Gold's gym and all your athletes are spread out. If I'm screaming at somebody like I'm screaming in a, in a college, I'll probably get arrested. That just doesn't happen. So that working relationship does matter and your coaching style does matter. And how you, how you approach your athletes absolutely does matter because it is a working relationship now. So the biggest things is, <laughs> go back to the list. You have your education. You have your experiences. You have all this stuff. Now, do you have the personality for the game? Do you have that ability to relate to your players, multiple players, from your 16-year-old Dominican to your 33-year-old free agent? Because that's the group you're going to work with. Can you work with those guys? Do you have the personality? Do you have the thick skin to do it? Because you're going to take a beating. They're going to tell you no. They're going to tell you you're wrong. They're going to tell you they don't want to do it. All that's going to happen. Okay. Do they trust you? That's the biggest thing. If they trust you, they'll work for you. If they don't trust you, they're not going to work for you. And that goes with your coaches too, and your front office, your manager, and your coaches around you. If they trust you, it'll work. If it doesn't, if they don't trust you, it's going to go bad. It's going to go bad pretty quick. And you're still going to spend six months with those people. So that's going to be awesome. So trust is a huge thing. And if your athletes trust you, you're not going to have those issues. You're going to, listen, if you spend 144 or 162 days with somebody out of 180, that's not including spring training, by the way. That's another 48 days every day with that, with that group. You're going to have your disagreements. That's okay you're going to have arguments. Also okay. Sometimes very healthy. Brings out good communication. I'm okay with that. Because I trust them. And I know it's not malicious. That, I think, for the most part, is maybe one of the biggest things. That if they trust you and they know that you have your, their best interest, best interest at heart, you're, you're a damn good coach. That's what you're there for. You get your athletes to buy in, you're successful. You're okay. That's the biggest thing for me. When we walk away by the end of the season and I still talk to my athletes and they text me and it's personal stuff and it's fun stuff and, hey, we got married and, or, hey, I'm getting married or, hey, th that's the good stuff. And when you have those relationships, when they come in the weight room and go, what do I got today? That's awesome. Because a lot of times you're going to walk in, you're going to see them and you go, you got nothing today. No, I got to lift. No, you don't. And if they trust you enough, 
They're like, see you tomorrow. Great. Because you know what? Whether they lift or not, you know what's going to happen at 7, 10 at night? We're going to play a baseball game. Unless it's raining and we're not in a dome. Then we're delayed to 11. And then we play a baseball game. Or we get rained out and then we have a doubleheader the next day. One of those ways we're playing that game. So know that no matter what we do, if you have the athlete's best interest at heart, they'll work for you and you'll be okay. But that does take time and trust. And it takes that personality to walk into a room and be able to relate and listen and be okay with other people's points of view and work with everybody on an individual basis. And sometimes 250 on 10 or 11 is hard. It's hard. But it gets done. Everybody has their own path. Mine's a little different. Um, I didn't expect to be in professional baseball, honestly. Uh, I started out as a firefighter EMT. That's where I started as a strength coach. I started running PT programs for my fire department. So I thought that was going to happen. And as I did that, they said, go get an education. Become more valuable. All right. Go get. So I went and got my bachelor's degree, exercise phys. Um, about that same time, I had the opportunity to do an internship with the Oakland A's. So I was like, yeah, okay, I'll try that, sure. So I go down there and I try that, I go, that's what I'm going to do. I immediately was hooked. I knew it. I knew it from there. But however, regardless that I knew that, I still had no experience. I worked with firefighters and I stocked shelves and wiped down benches and took notes. That was my experience point. So I had nothing. I had nothing to offer yet. I had a bachelor's degree. Actually, I didn't even have a bachelor's degree at the time. I had nothing. But once I did get my internship and I got my bachelor's degree, I did get accepted to the University of Tennessee. I got a graduate assistantship, and that's where it kind of started rolling for me. And I was, I was hooked. I loved the floor. I loved coaching. I loved the energy. I loved pushing weight. I just, I loved it. I loved working with athletes. I loved seeing what the body could do. I loved to see the athleticism come out of it. So I got my master's in human performance. Um, I did my assistantship. And then I still got opportunities to um, do some testing with the Nashville Predators. You want to talk about crazy athletes? Go work with hockey. Those guys are nuts. They're incredible, incredible athletes. We were doing 225, uh, this was in 2001. They do a force velocity curve with 225 on the bar and then go do a wing gate. And they'd be like, no, I'm not done yet. I mean, you're not done yet. They were all in every day. It was incredible. One of the best experiences I had. That's why I put it up. Um, and then my first uh, internship was with the Milwaukee Brewers in 2001. Uh, my full -time, first full-time job was with the Pirates in 2002. Just FYI, after that year, the Pittsburgh Pirates got rid of all full-time strength coaches, so that, that was a one and done. That was, that was nice. Um, so they were, well, hey, we did a great job, but um, we're going to move our money to somewhere else, so that, that was kind of a wash. So that was, uh, that was one year with them, and then Cincinnati Reds hired me the next year for AAA where I was in Louisville, um, 03, 04, and then I was uh, promoted to the coordinator in 05, where I spent nine years as the minor league coordinator and then went into uh, the major leagues. Uh, I got hired in 13, my first year was 14, and then I've been the director ever since. So that was my path, and it was all over the place. I think I've lived in 11 states, and out of that time I've been married, hmm, been married 15 years, and I've moved my family from Tennessee to Florida, Florida to Arizona, Arizona to Tennessee, Tennessee to Ohio. That doesn't make a wife happy, by the way. But she did it. She was awesome. She did it. Hey, we're moving. When are we moving? Uh, in 30 days. By the way, I got to go to Dayton tomorrow. Love you. Yeah, that went over well. So we move. But the biggest thing is, is that I had the opportunity and I wasn't going to say no. So all those things created opportunities for me and I moved. And it was and it worked. Jobs in baseball. 
How do you get a job in baseball? Have your education and certification. If they ask for a cover letter, resume, and reference, send all three. Please send all three. I, I joked lightly about it, but I'm going to say a third of the resumes and cover letters I get still don't have references with them. It says it right there. Please send references. Network, network, network with me. A bunch of people in the room. Those people out there. Network. Honestly, how I got my job was I was at University of Tennessee. Uh, NSCA was being held in Atlanta at the time. I drove down there. Nothing was happening um, as far as baseball. I didn't even know there were jobs available. I got invited to the Champion Nutrition. Um, uh, they were holding a little social for all the uh, strength coaches in professional baseball. I asked if I could go. They said uh, the rep was Steve Ward at the time, believe it or not. Said yes. I went up there. Resumes in hand, started talking to people, and I was hired by the Brewers that night. By the way, that, that, I don't think that happens anymore. But that night, and I had a job going out of college to Ogden, Utah for a short season job um, for three months. And that's how it started, just like that. And I think I handed out probably 30 resumes that day. So NSCA. And then the PBS CCS website, baseballstrength.org, uh, that's going to be your other spot where you're, we're going to see posts from all the organizations. And then over that, know you're going to start at the bottom. You're going to be in Billings. You're going to be in Greenville. Good. That's a great learning experience. You'll love it. And be ready to move. Biggest thing is be ready to move. Be ready. Hey, there's a lot of times I told my strength coach, you're going to be in Dayton. And then when they're driving down, actually, you're going to go to Daytona. <sighs> okay. Great. Sorry. Be aware of the salaries. The salaries are great, but if that's not in your wheelhouse, if 47 isn't good enough, don't get in baseball. That's just where they're at right now. And if it is, great. Know what you got. Know what you're expecting. And the biggest thing of all, be ready for the baseball season. Even in the minor leagues, it's 30 days of spring training. There are no days off. Sundays are not off. Even if you're religious, it's still not off. They're still playing. They hold chapel at the field, it's, it's fine. And then you get into your season and it's one to two days off a month. And those are usually travel days on a bus. And then you get home in September. And then you have instructs. And then if you're invited, then you work that. So know the baseball season. And if you wanna know more, ask us. We'll tell you, we love it. We're not gonna play it down. We'll tell you what the grind is, but we do love the grind. So if you're looking for a job in baseball, that's what you need to expect. Quick thank yous. Zach, who I've worked with since 05, helped me with pulling a lot of this information in. Uh, Ryan Stoneberg, I know he's not here, but he did all of that since 2005 to clean it up. And, um, and then Matt Krause, Alejo, Stucky, Chris Carlisle, Zach, and all the guys I've worked with, that's who made me who I am today. And then my family, my wife, Jessica, my daughter Elizabeth, and my son Jake let me do this. So I love them for that, and I thank them. Guys, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, do we have time for questions? No time for questions? No, we don't have time for questions. Well, I beat that. Take that. So if you do have questions, I'll be off the side of the stage. Please stop by, introduce yourself, ask me whatever you need. Thank you for your time, and I hope you guys enjoyed it.